That's just what it is. Hey, and we are on, and I'm hosting Caleb, and it's Switch of Events. There we go. <laughs> welcome, welcome. So, uh, I think we're here, what, for Angular, we're here for AI, we're here for Syracuse, huh? Yep. So you brought it up to me about Angular, and uh, you had, in the days before, Slot was released, Angular 17, and knowing a thing or two about Angular, I looked at it, and I realized it changed their whole syntax of their templating. Yeah. What What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I haven't, uh, it's been a bit since I've used Angular. Um. But yeah, it's uh well, I still in? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I lost the zoom window. Um yeah, it's been been a while, but the uh so I guess Angular already had to have used a compiler because it, it's it uses the decorators, right, for for all those components and such. Which yep. is isn't um standard JavaScript syntax. Um, yet, I think there's proposals for decorators, but it's not actually supported yet. I believe that they are now official and they don't do what the Angular ones do. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. But I think, you know, this is like a, a vast departure from JavaScript syntax, right? Yeah. Um, kind of similar to what Svelte's doing with their syntax and such, you know, very different from, from like standard JavaScript, but definitely a lot simpler. I think I, I, I read something about, there were certain, like doing an if else was just a pain in the butt previously. And now it's like a piece of cake or something. Yeah. I think in angular land, what you call a pain in the butt is going to be the learning curve for sure. ages. It's been the batteries included. It's been, you're all in on Angular, and at the time it was released, it was you were also all in on RxJS, this observable pattern, and TypeScript, and those were three things at once when the original Angular, which was Angular 2, came out. Template syntax different, observables, TypeScript. Right. Tough. Now today, 17, I think the template syntax part of the learning curve anybody who's got to get into it if they can do one thing to reduce the thought that goes into adopting it it's better and you look at that syntax and i think i'm happy to share a screen so that it's real obvious what we're talking about yeah sure this is the new syntax there's got to be something in here about the old syntax no, there's not. And there's fine you. enough. Out was the old, in with the new. There you go. Yeah, here you are. You're looking at uh, if, and then somewhere in the context of this template, we've got a reference to a user object, and it's human. It's going to get the profile. It does this thing with defer, which to me doesn't matter too much to discuss. It's just going to load it later. And uh, if not, it's got an else. So there you are in new syntax there's no star ngf there's no like maybe react does actual literal javascript if statements work in it's, it's closer anyway though it is closer yeah throw an at in front of the control flow right otherwise it's javascript ish yeah i wonder how the um you know, the formatters and the linters support was working out for that. I would imagine amazing. Angular's always got Google money, so they tend sure. to be on day one, like, and here's all of the, <laughs> just all bought all of this stuff. <laughs> yeah, they got an army of 100,000 engineers at Angular, so works yeah. out okay. I think it's always the advantage of Angular, by the way. It's stable by the time that it's used it's already been used at google for long enough or they've had a little army to get into it so 
That's a nice thing. When you're getting in on Angular, it's going to work if there's yeah. a fault in it. Uh, it's short. It's brief. It's workaroundable. Gotcha. I think I realize this is not exactly an Angular 17. Uh, I think it came out maybe in 16 or something. But Signals was the other big thing that came to Angular recently. Yeah, it was. Well, Angular's got marketing behind it all the time. I think about it was Signals, it's Module Federation and uh, standalone components. I'm just going back in the ages since the time that I've really used Angular day in, day out around what were the headlines. The Signals one caught me as a simple thing that seemed to be going across not only Angular, other places in the framework JavaScript world. Yeah. Folks were using signals it was meant to reduce complexity of redux like state management yeah. good nothing wrong with that i think in angular land it was meant to also replace observables nothing wrong yeah. with that too you get into what were the three things when angular came out that were part of the learning curve typescript observables and the syntax well everybody's used typescript so yeah. one for three ain't bad really uh I yep. think I could learn more about signals, but I haven't really got any desire to pick Angular up as an individual engineer. I was always getting into Angular when it was a team and a large team and a large company and that already adapted it. And it was like, hey, Pete can already do this. Get him on board immediately. So if you're if you're making a personal project, what do you uh, reach for? Uh, nothing today. I go uh, simple enough. The project I'm working now, I wanted a simple way to work with more or less static pages, and I used Pug P U G templates from ages ago in yeah. Express for I don't know a week or two. Then a quick little uh, GitHub Copilot just converted them all over to React. And I don't want to use React on the client. So I do server-side rendering React inside of Express. And the uh, simple thing is to say, I don't enjoy Next.js because of it's yeah. uh, just a lot going on. It's React pretending to be Angular and it's also not by the official team. And yeah. all of a sudden they're adapting and adopting. And uh, it's a trend sort of that will stick and is sticking. So yeah. I just built a website over the weekend, something I'm very happy with. Let me click over to that with uh, Koi Manua, who's a talented designer. She and I came up with this in about a day. And nice. this is uh, HTML and CSS. Wow. And Never heard of those languages. I know, I know. But the reality is this here, it's always going to do this. There's right. no JavaScript. It's just it works and it's going to keep working. Nice. Uh, I'll tab over to the SYR AI, which is built in Squarespace. And okay, I don't have any uh, code up. It's okay. Everybody knows what HTML looks like. Everybody knows what CSS looks like. But the reason for it really has been a lot of the ability to use GitHub Copilot in order to write things out. I'm preferring those things that are the most broadly and widely documented okay. because it gives you such high accuracy. And with such high accuracy on it, the productivity of being able to work with somewhat older or stayed or tried and true formats and syntaxes, it removes a lot of the need for what the other newer libraries help you with. It's really cool. Yeah, that's very true. Uh, a little bit of a side tangent to some of the stuff that I'm working on. I've been uh, working on, I guess not working on, but doing the exorcism 12 and 23 challenge, learn 12 languages in the year 2023, oh, one yeah. per month. And I tried to choose languages that were very far apart from each other conceptually mm. to try and, you know, broaden my understanding of languages in general and such. And, uh, and then I did a few languages that were a little more common. So C++, for instance, and um, I had Copilot running in VS Code there and on certain other languages like OCaml, or what's another one that it would do? OCaml was the one in particular that it would try and tell me how to do stuff and it would just get it completely wrong. Um, but C++, I, before I could even like start fi or finish writing out a comment line describing what I wanted done, it had written all the code for me 
as if I had written it myself, you know? And so at, at that point, I was like, am I really learning how to do C++? I was like, well, this is what I would have written, right? <laughs> so. Oh, uh, well, yeah, this is what I would have written. That is not true for me, almost. When I'm thinking about the usages I've had for Copilot, I haven't been attempting to learn anything new. I've been attempting to not learn anything new. Sure. And in particular, those things that I know I'll need to do once and then never again. Yeah. For example, I have this uh, finance accounting tax customer who's dealing with any projects they need to recur. They're replacing a system made by Thomson Reuters. It feels like it's from the 1970s. And it's a very good program. It's been around for ages. It does project recurrence for the tax industry based on it's a quarterly project. That makes sense. Do something three months later. Well, what happens when the fiscal year doesn't end in December? And it's like, I don't really want to think it out, all of the logic. So yeah. it's give me a recurrence function that takes into account if the year isn't ending at the end of the year. And right. then all of a sudden it's done it. Yeah. And is it any good? Well, I write a little unit test. It tells me, no, in fact, there's it didn't catch the edge case of January. And then a little bit extra. And I am so glad for that because I'll never need to write that function again. I never right. had to write it before and I can move on. And so what I like when it's doing things, they're either the things that I really don't want to think too hard about that are, they're just logic. They're just straight core rote logic. For some reason today, I had to rename a lot of things that were written in by people before on a Trello board, all of the names that were last name, first name. Sometimes they were last name, first name and sign, last name, first name. And I get into... How do I reorder that so they're both first and last? Well, write me a function that takes some name that's in last name first and put it first to last, and it gets it. And then I got to do a little bit of extra on top. It doesn't stop me from having to think, but the truth is I get to think about the better things, which is like, right. can we build this thing super fast and stable? Well, we can. Can we do it without having react oh yeah probably sure. uh, then react is good for types so you move away from pug yeah how about for the languages when you're learning them oh camel which is clearly and patently wrong as you say it the ability to translate from one to another if it's not generating new stuff can you right. go from c plus plus to camel kind of with some degree of accuracy um can copilot do it you're saying or can yeah. i yeah that's what i'm asking uh no I, that's kind of the there's two issues there one is syntax but then semantics is the, actually the harder one right um especially when you go from like c++ it, it's got tons of code to go off of and it knows c++ really well um ocaml or other languages like that uh or elixir even you know that i'm uh, we use at work no yeah. oh you, you use elixir a bit as well Never right it. oh i haven't okay well elixir and ocaml uh, Elixir more than OCaml actually are both um, entirely immutable. They're they're pure languages essentially. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you've got Copilot telling me, oh yeah, you to iterate over a thing, you just declare a variable and then you do a little loop thing. You can't do that. You don't. You can't. You don't have variables in in pure languages. Um, the word mm -hmm. variable is a bit of a misnomer because the value never varies. So you can't, you literally can't change the value of something. Okay. So this is where all of the training in the world, it gives it a disadvantage. If it had never learned what a variable was, it would not make that mistake, but it does know it. And it's used sort of incorrectly in the general vernacular. And all of a sudden you've got yeah. it looping over something that's just not even close to real, not yeah. even close to possible. Yeah. Things like that. Or closure, closure is another one that uh didn't do a really good job of but but it was a it was okay it still helped me with like um at least the routine things perhaps yep you know like elixir i, I use it in elixir and it's pretty good at guessing what i want based on surrounding context and things that i've already written oh yeah but if i give it a comment saying i want you to write me a function in elixir that does this thing it doesn't really do a very good job most of the time. So, Well, yeah, I guess there is a piece of it where you get to learn the 
new tool, the GitHub Copilot tool, whatever it is, and yeah. figure out its limits, constraints. I can show one thing that's been fun because it's removing dependencies from a project. If you ever use a SDK for a API, you wish that whoever wrote the SDK did a sane, reasonable job and also in it actually works. You mean to create something, the api.create actually creates the something, which it doesn't always. And uh, not so big a deal on the major ones, but it, it happens to be that some of the times when you're writing code, you're not dealing with a major, you're dealing with a two people in a basement kind of thing. They happen to be very good at building the API, but the SDK is the afterthought. So for that, I've been loving GitHub's ability to, if it's a popular enough API, do with very, very little help the writing of a new endpoint. Mm -hmm. But if it's a little lesser known, it can take a bit of the context and do something good. So here, by the way, you're seeing these uh, strategies. This is Passport JS. Yeah, so I've got to do all of this OAuth 2 stuff, and Express has been around for ages. Passport hasn't changed in ages, so mm -hmm. I'm not using any the Microsoft, Salesforce, Intuit. They all make very good SDKs. They're great SDKs, best SDKs you could ever want. And there's no reason to use them when you can go right to the lower level core of all of these things and have all of the visibility into the code. Hmm. Harvest. Do you know Harvest? Have you heard of Harvest? The time time tracking? Time tracking, yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So you're seeing my screen here. I've got a, a file here. There's some uh, types in it. And let's close those up and get to... We have create harvest invoice, delete harvest invoice, get harvest invoice. We don't have update harvest invoice. So a simple one is... Create a update harvest invoice function. And at this point here, I've given it like the vaguest thing in the world. And it knows enough in the core of its own world to get the endpoint correct. And then when you mentioned what got me into here, that it has the context from around it. Yeah. It, also knows that these other three functions are written in the identical way. So it's included my nice environment variable in the right. auth there from the top of the file. It's got the way of responding with the error if it's not the identical way to the other one there and the other one here and the other one here. So it's influenced me in a way, first of all, to move away from third-party SDKs ever for any reason to okay. also like the way I organize my file. I try to give my code base a uh, different structure so that the copilot has the context. Oh, okay. I, I might've written those as like single file functions so I could just do it a little bit differently, but gotcha. it's, it's been cool. Yeah, that, that right there. I do that all day and I just move on. I'm very, very confident in it. It works more times than it doesn't. And that's awesome. That's good. Yeah. I suppose that's a good segue into AI stuff. AI stuff. Let's talk about it. It's a whole open AI debacle at the moment. You say that. And I got a text from a pal of mine. You know, I'm, uh, Samuel. He's like, well, I guess that's startup life, and he forwards me the New York Times article that Sam's Sam Altman's out. Yeah, I Are you had, what's going on? Well, I hadn't had my phone on me in like two or three days at that point. I didn't have my iPhone like doing my normal day in day out checking. Okay. So I got the message when I didn't know what's going on in the world, and then yeah. I saw that one. It was like so much has changed since I, since I wasn't. It all, it all happened very quickly. So I, I can try and give a summary, I suppose, because I yeah. I'm kind of watching it live. Uh, I'm not I'm not exactly a Twitter user, so I don't I'm not that 
live with the information but i mm -hmm. follow people who are then on the twitter <laughs> so or x whatever you call it what you are do you call it x do you call it twitter i call it x well next do you use it nope okay yeah i i haven't really been using any of those but anyway so i guess it was friday friday sam was let go from open ai by the board and the whole history of opening eye is really strange because it was originally a non-for-profit. That's why they have a board. They tried to make a transition to a for-profit company after realizing how much money they could make, essentially. And I say they, I don't know who they is, but some people wanted to make money off of this, right? No. The other weird thing is that Sam Altman uh, has zero shares in the company in opening eye. No. So he's just this the CEO, you know, apparently supposedly a bene benevolent dictator sort of thing but yeah. uh i don't know so they booted him uh and then i guess what happened then is uh it, it shocked everybody because the, the board didn't tell anybody why mm -hmm. internally or externally like there was no communication about why they booted him and then um over the weekend everything just happened so they had assigned an interim CEO who was the CTO, I think. Um, she and a whole bunch of other people who work with Sam all decided, all said that they are, they basically threatened to leave as well. Like, okay, we're all out as well if Sam's out. And then on Sunday, uh, Microsoft offered a position to Sam and any other person at OpenAI who wants to leave. Basically, like, yeah, you can come here. And I think Microsoft has 49% stakeholder in OpenAI or something like that. Like, they're not a majority, but they're basically the largest shareholder. Mm -hmm. And so they're they're basically like, okay, well, we need, this, we need to make sure that we can save this, this relationship with OpenAI and the whole thing doesn't fall apart. And then the ex-Twitch CEO was offered the CEO position. And I think he's still... The interim CEO right now, but apparently some people at OpenAI are or Sam is thinking that he could still go back somehow as a CEO, but that the whole board needs to resign. And I think it just dropped today that might be a clue to what happened. Someone on the board um is the CEO of a competitor AI company called Poe. And uh, OpenAI recently made an announcement of custom GPTs where you can like provide your own data, mm -hmm. kind of like what you're doing, right, with Syracuse AI sort of thing, mm -hmm. and that was like Poe's market. And so basically, this uh this announcement uh from OpenAI kind of took that guy, the CEO of Poe, by surprise. He's like, oh, you basically made this entire competitor product without telling me and i think it seems obvious to most people at the, at the moment that he was the one who inst uh, instigated the um you know booting sam that's i think the version of the story as i understand it but nobody really knows what's going on <laughs> well first of all it doesn't make a hole to my day in day out of just regular living yeah. No, there's no meaning to like my world in the sense of the technology has been built and yeah. the practical innovation of using transformers at such a scale is the what open ai has to offer to the world or right. has offered to the world the paid gpt service is nominally better than some of the other ones and the ability for those who built it to keep ahead of those others who are now replicating it is well it's a challenge it's like not guaranteed that they are the quote-unquote absolute most brilliant people in the world they're just the most brilliant for the two days head start they got on everybody else who now can see what a large language model can do so yeah. Whether OpenAI collapses or continues, it's been done in the sense of it exists. The 
world has the ability to do math just the same as those people there and we'll have large language models into the future which is exciting and good and then you get into the like who are any of these people who is sam and like are, are we sad that he lost his job well no tough tough i don't feel so bad he's done pretty well as the previous president of y combinator he's got all the money in the world to not take a salary to not take any share or equity to live in a he lives where like it's cool to not make money in salary oh, um, yeah. you know what it is with those tech folks it's all in equity so when somebody says oh, i don't take salary well now after your company got valued at 100 million dollars and you own 70 percent of it like good for you to not take salary how noble are you i don't know yeah so you know i'm reminded of there was this financier who in the american revolution uh went bankrupt uh paying the soldiers bills he was a very wealthy man you get into how does america uh get formed and the man sacrifices basically everything goes into debt beyond it and dies poor and penniless and it was to be seen as like a patriot in the way that Sam has done what he did. I don't think it was so much that as just he wanted to be cool. Like, well, look how cool I am. No salary. No. Oh, everybody else has no salary. Fine. I'm going further. No equity. Like, wow. <laughs> So it doesn't make a whole lot of difference to me. Don't care if he gets fired. Don't care if he gets rehired. Don't care if the whole of OpenAI as an organization collapses into Microsoft or what. Sure. It's like, uh, well, here, I've listened to Sam Altman speak at length in front of Congress. Mm -hmm. And he got asked a question, number of questions. Is this thing going to kill your uh, family? Was sort of on the minds of people. And some of the senators voiced that. Is this thing going to replace jobs? And some people. And in that hearing, somebody, a lawyer senator, asked, what's going on with lawsuits? I don't know. You know, they're kind of typical, is what Sam had said. And then the thought afterwards expressed by that lawyer senator was, it seems pretty apparent that there's some copyright issues here. And Sam's like, no, nah, no issues. Hmm. So he's very much vested in the success of the idea of not abiding the copyright laws. And that one, that one to me is a very core unsolved piece of the thing. And whether he keeps his job or not, we got to work out how this thing that I'm doing here with this GitHub Copilot can keep letting me be productive without having to pay for it. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Well, what do you think Sam has to offer now best? Does he have something best to offer with Microsoft? Is it with keeping OpenAI together? I don't know. OpenAI has been a really strange company to me. Um, you know, it's clearly changed its direction. You know, it's not really... And I think that's kind of what the struggle is at the moment. You know, it started off as this supposedly benevolent nonprofit trying to make AGI, you know, artificial general intelligence and, uh, and you know, seemingly made some progress towards that end. And then enough progress that they're like, hey, we should make some money off of this and then lock down all of our patents and everything. And they're not open anymore. And there, there's the struggle between like making money and the board supposedly still thinking that their mission is AGI for everyone, you know, for the good of all humanity or whatever. Um, I don't know. It's a weird game to be playing. Like just either admit that you're a for profit or not, you know. And and the other bit is like they are very clearly joined to Microsoft at the hip, you know, Microsoft has invested so much money in them. I, I bet you that all of their compute and everything is Microsoft um, stuff. 
Yeah, I think it's maybe Claude, the competitor out of Anthropic that's gone in diversified providers. They're funded by Google and AWS and okay. using Google and AWS. But I think uh, 100% of the processors making GPT the brand are at Microsoft. And that's fine, really, in one way, just... It's a challenging thing to get a capital intensive endeavor off the ground, which GPT clearly is. So you've got to get yeah. some backing and yeah, joined at the hip by Microsoft, like Lil Wayne and Birdman. Eventually, <laughs> well, Birdman was 51% owner of Young Money, Cash Money and Lil Wayne was 49% owner. And at the end of the day, Lil Wayne like signed on Drake and Nicki Minaj and they got into this big lawsuit when Birdman stopped paying stuff out and he was like, I'm 51% owner. Lawsuits went down and Wayne came out ahead and he came out with the masters for both Nicki Minaj and Drake and for himself, sold them on for $100 million. When you get that little like 1% difference, it gets tough. Yeah. Sometimes that 1% is like the whole world and you've got a lot of, you can stand on that 1%. But in right. other cases, that 49%, you're not talking about like majority ownership in the sense of 90 to 10. You're dealing with, you're down to the wire. Yeah. You're right, joined at the hip. And just the amount of influence, the amount yeah. of control, the amount of uh, what does what does independence of open AI look like? Yeah, probably the same with or without Sam. That's probably got a lot more to do with that Microsoft investment. Yeah, and I kind of I'm generally I'm, I'm favorable of Microsoft and kind of rooting for them to win if it comes to them and Google. Um, oh. Like uh, actually, since since Microsoft didn't you know added that uh, you know the Bing uh, chat stuff, I don't really even use the, the chat stuff too much, but I have actually switched over to Bing, and I will admit, many times the results are not as good as Google, but I've been, I've been trying to stick with it because like Google as a monopoly on the search is really a kind of a problem in my opinion, and uh, and they just kind of they're so far ahead. The only way for Microsoft to catch up is if people just started using Bing, and I know people don't like the fact that. Microsoft has been like shoving down edge down people's throat and things like that, you know. And yeah. but just this week also, uh, we found out that Google has uh if you're using Firefox, YouTube will be slower for you. I saw that today. Uh, just the quick headline getting ready for this call. It's a five yeah. second delay to anybody using an ad blocker right. outside of Chrome. Yeah, so right. there you go. That's not nice. And then you get down to the nitty gritty. I would like for them all to lose between Google and OpenAI and <laughs> Microsoft because I don't know them and I'm never going to meet any of them. And I do know you and I do know a couple other people around here. And while Google has to run in the cloud because of all of the indexing that they did, all of the things that it took to get there, there was no other option. Once one of these models are trained, I can run on a desktop computer. And at yeah. that point, if you're all right with, and you're looking for reference information, it's it's kind of come full circle, full, full circle. You can yeah. invest a little bit of money and buy like the Encyclopedia Britannica, pop that on your desk for five grand or seven grand, whatever the cost of a couple of good NVIDIA processors is, and then never mind whatever's going on halfway across the country. Yeah. And that's okay by me. That's like, it's a frustration that it's phrased like, who's going to win Microsoft or OpenAI or Google when the awesome part is that the math has been done and the models have been trained. Can't they be distributed? Can't we deal with destroying monopolies in the courts and by way of actually doing something new and different and yeah localizing compute and hey how about syr.ai and yeah, uh, own your ai or ai will own you it just makes me so uh patriotic 
in, in a real true and honest way, when I get to work with the people that are near me and when we're closer to the source code as engineers, it feels like qualitatively more capable of doing things for the people around us. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I, uh, on the patriotism thing, I've never been very patriotic and maybe I'm not supposed to say that out loud, but you know, I, I, I lived, uh, uh, growing up in countries all over the world and I'm, I was born in Malaysia, you know, and my, my cultural identity is not really tied to this country, but having lived in upstate New York for as long as I have, uh, I'm pretty proud of being in upstate New York, uh, mm-hmm. more than I am about being in America. Um, and just kind of like this local, you know, cause I grew up in, between Rochester and Syracuse, you know, just up, just this region, you know, yeah. so, yes, I'm, I'm proud to be from this area. Well, I'm proud to be wherever I'm at. Generally speaking, when I'm in New York, I'm proud to be a New Yorker. And I'm not thinking about being an American. And then, like, my Australian friend comes by, and I'm like, yo, America's the bomb. You don't even, come on, man. All right, America's got its problems, but only we can talk about them. Don't you go bad mouth in my ridiculous government. You know, it's my ridiculous. So patriotism changes for me. But one thing that's true about it is, I'm not from Silicon Valley and I'm not Mark Zuckerberg and nobody that I know is. And so it's very easy for me to look at the very, very different economy of uh, Syracuse, New York, very much more in common with uh, a lot of places in Europe than with a region of California that's got all the power and control and money and resources and somehow for ages goodwill but it seems like they've lost some of that hmm. you were born in malaysia yeah i was born in malaysia so my back, background me a minute on the other countries after malaysia my dad's a electrical engineer works for harris uh l3 harris now the radio company so we were in saudi arabia for three years and kuwait for five years so uh spent a good amount of time you know overseas and then my mom's actually chinese from malaysia so i'm half chinese and then we've just been to like we've been to like 27 countries and then my wife is from the philippines hmm. um we met online i brought her to the u.s from the philippines so um we're still we all of our family is still over there so um yeah it's just a global family at this point well that one is Awesome. And to learn that about you, that's real cool. I got to revisit. I met with your wife and uh, I was right when we were meeting. And I'll recall the moment, the day you and I were at the a common space and what was yeah. Syracuse Coworks at the time when it was the version that was the nonprofit. And I, it was a good time. I was like, all yeah. right, what's up with this dude and his wife? Oh, oh we just moved here. I didn't realize she moved from the Philippines. Yeah, she did. Yeah. That's cool. That was pretty early on, I think. Yeah. That's pretty cool. So we're coming up to the last minute and yep. I'll leave it to you. Wrap it however you like with the idea that you got the final word. And whenever you stop talking, I'm going to hit the end button. So for okay. me, this is my sign off. Well, thanks, Peter. I appreciate for jumping on and taking on the host position today. <laughs> um with all our technical difficulties. Um, we'd love to talk more. Or maybe we'll we'll try this again sometime soon. Um, I think I'd like to talk more about maybe the divorce of uh, perception on different software communities um, and like the perception of the influencer community in the tech world versus like day-to-day software developers that you don't even hear about and what they do. Um, so that'd be kind of a neat topic at some point. But thanks again, Peter.